Hello, and welcome to Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. My name is Ben Houck, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce the 19th episode in our ongoing series. Earlier this month, IGS trustees Lance Strait and Tom Gencarelli visited Mexico City, where they were guests of IGS trustee Laura Trujillo, who is a professor of philosophy at Panamericana University. During the visit, they were asked to record video segments to be posted to the university's social media accounts and decided to record our own March podcast there as well. Panamericana's Media Lab director, Gustavo Navarro, joins our three trustees as both interviewer and guest as the group enters into a conversation about media ecology, general semantics, and more. Let's hear what they had to say. Hello and welcome to another episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. I'm Lance Strait, the president of the IGS. I'm here with our treasurer, Tom Gencarelli, and we've taken our show on the road for this March episode. We're in Mexico City, where we're guests of Universidad Panamericana, that's Panamericana University for you Anglos out there. And we're here as guests of IGS trustee, Laura Trujillo. Laura, thank you very much for having us here. Thank you to you for coming, and thank you for having me here. And we have been, uh, Tom and I have been speaking to various groups of faculty and graduate students and undergraduates about general semantics and media ecology. And right now we are in the university, Panamericana's university's media lab, and we're here with Gustavo Echevarria. Did I say that reasonably well? Perfectly fine, yeah. that Yes, and he is the director of the media lab, so thank you very much, Gustavo, for uh, hosting us here. And I'll just say that if this sounds better than our usual podcast, it's because this is a fully equipped, very professional media lab that we're working with, unlike our usual fair. So thank you, Gustavo. Yeah, thank you for coming. We're really excited to have you guys here. And we've been having a great time here, haven't we, Tom? Absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, um, a lot of uh, great students and uh, uh, great networking with faculty. And um, it, it really is unbelievable to, uh, to come down here and compare um, students and, and operations and um, with, with what we have back home. and. Uh, um, it's been just a whirlwind, but great. Yes, and, and we've also had the opportunity to visit two other universities, right, Laura? Yes, uh, we went to Ibero, Universidad Iberoamericana, and the Tecnológico of Monterrey, which right. was great for us. Yes, so a lot of variety, a lot of interesting comparisons, but of course our heart belongs to Panamericana. And, uh, and they're not holding a gun to my head for saying this, but we do want to butter up our hosts here. Oh, well, thank you. And, and of course, uh, it's been a great week for us here at the Panamericana, having you guys here. They, I, I know you've talked to undergrads and grad students as well, as well as the faculty, as you were saying. And actually, yesterday I was talking to a couple of them, a couple of our undergrads, and they are really excited and very interested now in, in media ecology. It's, this was the first time they heard about it as a as a topic, actually, and they loved it. And I I should explain that while we're doing our podcast, we are kind of multitasking or or repurposing. I don't know what what would be the word for this, Tom, but we're taking the content here. But uh, Gustavo is also going to interview us for uh, for the work that you're doing here. What, what are you going to use this uh, for? Well, actually, more than an interview, I, I would call this just a yeah, a general conversation on media ecology. And um, Because, well, as I was saying, it, it's a new term for some of our students, at, at least. And as we here at MidLab have a couple of projects, uh, podcasts and some TV shows, um, and we're trying to bring our students closer to academia as they are undergrads, for them to pursue a, a career in academia if, if they want to, or to if they go to the trade of media or to work in a company or if they want to uh, be entrepreneurs in, in the media business or whatever, I well, we believe that it would be very interesting to for them to know about media ecology and how that can impact their work uh, and what they do for a living in the future or starting right now as students. 
And that's great. And, and Laura, you're also teaching philosophy here. Yes, that's I'm your... teaching philosophy and um, humanities. And of course, uh, I teach some classes in um, communication. So uh, the students are, are great. They, they love media. And I also think that media ecology for, for them is, is great because it, it, it could be applied to everything. Yes. Indeed. So, Gustavo, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, I... See, this is great. I don't have to think. We don't have to think too much. This is Gustavo's <laughs> job now. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Good show. <laughs> I hope I can do a good job at the audit. Um, I would like to start by asking, how would you explain, or how do you explain, um, what media ecology is as a discipline, but to a teenager? I mean, at someone who is... Uh, well, embedded and submerged in media most of the time. They are looking at their screens all the time, and they are hyper-connected and talk, having multiple uh, conversations at the same time with people all, all, all around the world, and sometimes uh, they feel more connected to someone they haven't met in real life. Uh, well, they, feel, they can feel more connected to someone uh, on the other side of the world uh, than to their real actual classmates. So... Um, I mean, based on your experience and you talking about this in, in many different uh, forums and audiences, how do, you, how do you explain what media ecology and the work you are doing uh, to someone like that, to teenager, teenagers? Well, for me, um, when everyone is given a phone at a fairly early age, and they're given a phone because what? Because, well, parents want to have uh, a sort of tetherless tether to their child, right? It's this device that they can, you know, call, they can text, they can keep in touch and, you know, not worry so much. But of course, you know, a teenager gets that phone and, and it's teenagers in the United States. I'm not sure when, when people are given phones here by their parents, but, you know, early teen years. Um, but that's not what the, the teenager uses it for. The teenager uses it for all of the cool things that their friends are doing. And, you know, it's completely different. And then, you know, the parents try to text and don't get an answer, right? Mm -hmm. But as users, right, and, and as a, a person who is adopting this technology and doing all of these things that, again, are all about status and, and cool, um, do they understand exactly what is happening to them? And, and I say it deliberately that way, right? Do they understand what both the device means in their lives, and then they, do they understand what all of these apps and platforms that they use mean? We'll, we'll get undergraduate students who, who come to us, and when it comes time to write papers, they'll write papers about their experience, um, but they'll talk about the kinds of... It's not that they're talking about cliché things. They're talking about things that are important to them, like bullying, um, like um, the, what happens for young women with all of the imagery of what it means to be beautiful. Right? And, you know, but they'll... They'll talk about it in cliched and simplified ways. Mm -hmm. And so what they need is, is really a program of, I don't like to call it media literacy, but that's the phrase people know. They need a program of education, of media education, to teach them about what is going on with this stuff and be able to then negotiate it in their lives in a way that's more, more healthy and more positive and not just you know, doing what everybody does and taking it all for granted. Awesome. Okay, so um, as you as you were talking right now, I, I well, a few years ago, I was working at a K-12 uh, school here in Mexico City. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was 2009, 2010, but anyway, I mean, Facebook was fairly recent mm -hmm. by the time. And at the school we started, well, one of the changes I, uh, I had to manage was going from print printouts as a means of communication with the parents to using to start using Facebook groups and chats and sending emails instead of the typical printer that the teacher would put in the in the backpack of the uh, little kids and yeah. stuff like that so um, it was really uh, I mean it was really fun of, in a way but also quite stressing for some of the families and special parents back then um, because they felt that they weren't 
uh, getting enough information. That was the main, the main like um, criticism or the yeah the cry out was that they were getting less information because they were just to having maybe two or three pieces of paper a week, and we were now sending just a couple of emails or messages right. or stuff like that. So because email changes, it's not it, the content doesn't translate from one medium to another. Each it's medium influences the kind of content you get. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And exactly. so you get a different kind of content, and in this case, less content. That's right, that's right. And and it was a lot of, uh, many times it was shorter in, in form. Mm -hmm. We were we were making a point of uh, just giving the ex only the essential information instead right. of, uh, well, anyway, so. And it's also, if you have a whole page, mm -hmm. you're not going to just have two sentences there because exactly. it'll looks, it won't look right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So you're going to think about adding more and adding more explanation. Mm -hmm. And on an email, I, I'm sure we've all gotten emails that go on and on and on, you know, very long emails. Uh, you know, just an even some where there are, aren't even any paragraphs to them and they just go on and on. And... And, and especially when we start reading them on our phones rather than on a, on a computer, um, it becomes very hard to deal with that. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just going to say, because mm -hmm. early on I did an anthology, I co-edited an anthology called Communication in Cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And for the second uh, edition, I was able to get Camille Paglia, who's a well-known uh, public intellectual in, in the U.S., to provide a little piece where she wrote about writing for Salon magazine. Uh, it's an online magazine, a, a web-based magazine, and she explained how writing for, an, uh, for the Internet, uh, you know, she understood that you had to write differently than writing for a print magazine. We mm -hmm. call them both magazines. That's one of Neil Postman's points coming from general semantics is that, you know, we use the same word for something new, but really we need a new word because it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So she's explaining that even her choice of verbs and, uh, and, and certainly like sentence structure and paragraphing changes uh, when you go from print to online, even though we say it's, it's mail, it's a letter, it's it's a message. It's it's an article. It's a magazine, but they're not the same thing. To take off from that, a um, couple of years ago at our National Communication Association conference, uh, there was this woman who who's now teaching at Cornell University, um, but she did uh, a paper for a media ecology panel, and the title of her paper. I, I was the respondent to the panel, and mm -hmm. the title of her paper was very <coughs> simply, "What is a magazine?" Well. What a stupid question. Everyone knows what a magazine is, right? Well, no. But do right? we? <laughs> when, when you have a magazine, when you go to the dentist's office and there's a, a table with magazines, and I don't even know if they do that that much anymore. because no, they everyone, just have screens and, they, and you can't even shut them up, you know. And, yeah. Well, and you come with your phone, so why do you need their magazines? Why do they need to spend the money? But when you, when you move a magazine, when you reposition it to an online magazine, a website, what makes it uh, still a magazine and what makes it not different than any other kind of website mm -hmm. presenting content? Mm -hmm. How is it still what we consider a magazine? Um, the or other thing... paper. Well, well is, is it just paper mm -hmm. or, or does it, again, do we just call it a website? But if we call it a website, then they're all blending together. There are, you know, I, I had a student the other day who... Uh, looked up online in a class that there were 13.2 billion or so unique websites, and you know so much for Vogue magazine or the or the big magazines mm -hmm. when they're one of 13.2 billion <laughs> as opposed to a couple of hundred in a, in a Barnes and Noble. And and by the way, in Sports Illustrated, I just read this this morning. Sports Illustrated is discontinuing its paper magazine. Wow, huh? yeah. not surprising. But you know, I mean, part the strongholds. You know, part paper. part of that is that when you're printing. You have to put together a physical object, and what comes out of that practice is the idea of the periodical, where it's published, say, monthly or weekly or, you know, whatever, but mm -hmm. on a schedule, and everything is collected for that issue, the idea of an issue. And then when they go online, I, you know, Marshall McLuhan made the point that the content of a medium is always another medium. 
which is a bit exaggerated, but it's the idea that when you have a new medium, often the first thing you do is try to do the same old thing in the new medium. So what we see you know, online, especially early on, is trying to recreate the magazine or to take physical magazines that are coming out and make a uh, digital or an online version of it in parallel, but there's no need for an issue anymore. That that very idea of an issue that collects certain pieces that are not necessarily necessarily related to each other disappears, and instead you post articles as soon as they're ready to be posted. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is also happening with academic journals as well. That yeah. you know, Tom and I have been uh, talking about this in regard to et cetera, which we don't want to do um, because we feel that the appropriate medium for a journal, especially for a general semantics journal, is in print right. and well, yeah. is in this sort of collection, you know, quarterly collection. But what happens is, you know, and Tom, you're saying it's a website, but the, in, in another sense, it becomes a database. Mm -hmm. It's just a database of items that, mm -hmm. that get added to and get added to. So in what sense is it still a magazine uh, a apart journal. from using an old map to try to refer to a new territory, and again, in general semantics, we say the map is not the territory, and in this case, it, be, we, it turns into being a bad map because it no longer applies to this territory. It's sort of like when you have, a, in the old days, when we had road maps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, paper road maps instead of GPS, right. and at a certain point, the road might change. There might be construction or something, and so the map no longer applies, it becomes out of date. Okay. Um, it's the same thing with uh, newspapers, right? Yeah. Which, again, is now a silly name, right? It's, uh, it doesn't work so much anymore, but the musical artist Prince, when he was alive, he had a fight with his record company, and he came to calling himself the artist formerly known as Prince. And so I call you know news websites the the websites of what were formerly known as newspapers. It's obviously not paper, and, and it's funny too, we talk about hard copy now, right? Yeah. When we talk about et cetera, as opposed to what? As opposed to soft copy? But but <laughs> it's, it's the same thing with the newspaper that it's not today's news anymore, right? There are stories that were originally presented yesterday, but now they've been updated, and so they're still on that front page, if I can call it the front page, um, and then there are the stories that continue to uh, uh, accumulate, mm -hmm. and it becomes very unclear what is, in, in the sense of, for those, for those of us who used to read a physical newspaper, what is today's news? Mm -hmm. What would be if I went to the kiosk and you know, put my money in and, and picked a copy out? What is going on now? Right? You sort yeah. of get this complete uh, um, run of everything that's been going on lately. Plus, mm -hmm. you get the whole archive. Yeah, and and that is also a change because, and in a way, you might say that's a positive change because we can go and look up news that you know items that go back in time to an earlier time, uh, which you couldn't do before because the newspaper is you know today's newspaper is tomorrow's fish wrap, mm -hmm. uh, you know as we, as we say. You what know, do fish markets do anyway? I mean, yeah. <laughs> to, to your question, talking mm -hmm. about things like this, it's not that it's fun and, and an intellectual exercise, although it is. But but these are the kinds of things that we would suggest to people. This is what you need to be thinking about and understanding. Okay, and I think well, mo most of our students face this reality. I don't I don't know if every day, but but, but with a fur yeah fairly common. Uh, what I mean is, for example, we we have a, a news website. Uh, it's medialab.news. Um, and from time, I mean, we have a group of writers and copywriters and a, a team of uh, junior editors, uh, and they, they do a great job. Um, they do a great job. But from time to time, we, we yeah, one student or two or some students <coughs> will come and they will, they will try to get us to publish um, a paper that they wrote or an essay they wrote for a class. Uh, which they consider is very good, and they are, they usually are, <clears throat> but then we have to walk them through the process of editing for web, and they sometimes they just don't understand why we have to do that, 
because they they have a great essay they got maybe an a plus what well, we use a different scale here in mexico it's from one to ten ten is the top grade uh -huh. you can get so they have a ten uh, in an essay it's a great essay congratulations from their teacher or their professor or whoever assigned it and graded it mm, they they will try to publish it on their website just as, as it is yeah and <clears throat> well we just don't let them because it's going <laughs> to be too long the structure will be uh different they don't have yes. catchy enough titles usually they, they we will make them divide the the piece in different sections stuff like that so even though they that piece of content has never been printed out it's all it's all digital because they they wrote on google docs they sent it uh, to the teacher using the whatever uh, the platform they use and it was graded digitally it has to be transformed or adapted for a different for a different um, absolutely medium well, yeah. to, to go back to your example of the, uh -huh. the k through 12 program and the missives that were sent out to parents uh -huh. in the students backpack and then we changed and we do it via email and social media mm -hmm. in a former world in a former time in a former culture people would read something of length and you know we understood that that print literacy expected our expected us to have the attention to be able to take the time to carefully do the work to read that document and over time as things have changed um, we have less of an ability to sustain that attention. Now, how did that happen? Part of the cause is the change of media, right? When I get on my phone and I open up an email and suddenly I realize I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling, you know. Doom scrolling. They, they do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like this is inappropriate to what I'm doing on my phone. It's hard to read it on my phone. And so, again, when we, when we talk about decreased attention spans, that's not something that is – we shouldn't be talking about it by saying this is something that's happening to us as people, mm -hmm. but say that this is something that media are dictating and shaping for us. And, and I think that that's an excellent point, and, and it's worth mentioning, mm -hmm. you know, in, in conjunction with that. Uh, and the Institute of General Semantics every year has its annual Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture. Um, Shameless plug. Yes, we will. We, <laughs> you open the door to that, and well, I will I have step. Mine with my I will <laughs> step right through to it. That uh, this uh, this year, tour twenty twenty four, it'll be September twenty to twenty second. Uh, it's always in New York City. We're well, not always historically, but I mean nowadays it is. Um, and of course, Laura will be there, right? Laura, you're going to come. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes, yeah, so always yeah. comes. And <laughs> Gustavo, you're welcome to join us as oh, well. Great. Um, I love to. Yeah. And the, you know, and it starts off. I mean, on uh, the September 20th, the Friday evening, uh, in the main event, along with with a very nice dinner, I'll add, is uh, the lecture itself. And this year's lecturer will be Marianne Wolf who has written extensively and researched about reading and how reading uh, neurologically changes. It actually literally changes the way your brain works, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. that it changes the structure of the brain and the function of, of the brain. And this was something that earlier media ecologists like Marshall yeah. McLuhan, they kind of intuitively understood this. They stay they made the leap, but they didn't have the evidence. And so you had other people going, oh, there's no evidence for this. You're just making this up. But uh, over time and after their time, research has, has borne this out, that it actually changes you. And, and we've all been changed by this, you know, because we all live in this environment of constant stimulation and, and so forth. And Laura, would you agree? I mean, do you feel like you've been changed Yes, I, I was thinking out about the um, the effects of all these changes in the in the media environment and the information because now uh, all the information is decentralized, right? So we we can access to uh, any information through our cell phone or through our computers. So it's it's amazing. So um oh, well um. Based on what Laura was saying and, and the, how the, the, this conversation has been going through, um, 
I, I just remember something that I really wanted to ask you guys. Uh, it's it's well based on. You what see, that you almost forgot I'm because sorry. you you have a computer and all this technology in front of you. I'm and sorry. You get distracted. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm sorry. And you've just further some, distracted. Him. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I, that was your purpose. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Uh, sorry for the uh, distraction, but um, are we really in a position to? keep studying this. I mean, as you were saying earlier, uh, early media ecologists were saying things that people didn't, that they, they I mean, there just wasn't enough evidence. Yeah. Um, now we do have it, but uh, we've been using digital uh, devices for less than 50 years. Uh, smartphones are less than 15 years old, I think. In the, like, yeah, like for yeah. the general yeah. public, right? Um, This hyper-connectivity that, that is now our environment and this, uh, the place we're living in, um, in evolutionary terms, I mean, there's not been enough time to really understand how this is changing our brains or the ways we are uh, connecting to other people and how we are developing relations. And um, I mean, can we really know what is going on now? <laughs> That'll be my question. What a and great question. And Perfect. what is going on is the great general semantics question. I know. We turn in, we go. Exactly. And, and by the way, I love the way that you referred to it as an environment. So great. That's very me ecological. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, and and, uh, and also, an again, to include general semantics, because yeah. it's, you know, Korsipsky refer to the neuro neurolinguistic and neurosemantic environment yeah. and that is exactly you know that all of this stuff that you're talking about <laughs> is directly stimulating our nervous systems uh, yeah and uh, you know in a very nervous way <laughs> I mean I have two responses right and one is to say that this stuff is happening and we're not going to be able to put the brakes on any of it And when you think about the reasons why um, we can't, well, they're really complex. They have to do with, you know, industrial factors. They have to do with the fact that we, uh, as a species, love our tools, love our technology so much. We think it's all progress. It's all for the better. It's all to make our lives easier and give us more, you know, free time and, and leisure time to pursue pleasure. And, right? So there's no way we're going to stop the changes that are afoot now and the ones we can't even foresee. Mm -hmm. That's a given. What a media ecologist would say, though, and, and I'm thinking of this when, when Lance brings up Marianne Wolf and, um, and the neuroscience of understanding reading. What media ecology is about, one of the things it's about, is the idea of balance. And we can go full, you know, tilt into this future But do we want to at the same time, do we need to conserve and preserve the things that we might be leaving behind in this rush, right? The, the idea, and I, I think, you know, Neil, uh, Lance and, and me both as students of Neil Postman, our media ecology uh, is, is very much about the idea that, that print literacy and, and text-based literacy before we got too far into the digital environment Is, is essential to really being able to think and understand and thus live in, in the world we live in in successful ways, right? And it's, mm -hmm. I mean, we're not just talking about careers in media. We're talking about living in a world of, of media. So um, this idea of balance suggests that as we move whole hog into this future that we don't leave behind what we shouldn't. And, uh, you know, it, it depends on what level we're talking about and what level we're looking at, too. On the individual level, you can make a lot of changes. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there are ideas of just turning stuff off or taking breaks, you know. Uh, <coughs> and, of course, we encourage people to read and, and especially to read on paper because, reading on screens does, you know, it is a different experience, mm -hmm. even though, you know, you take the same book, but there's something about the screen Or that, handwriting that changes. Or yeah, handwriting, um, you know, and I, they find that students learn better when they take notes by, with pen and paper, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and we see the opposite going on with AI, for example, where uh, most of the AI apps are all about not having to read. 
They're saying, you know, okay, you don't have to read, you know, this message or you don't have to re go through this website or, or this article. It will summarize it for you. And that's really bad because a lot of, you know, times it's not what the AI would find significant. Something that is actually insignificant in, the, in this text as far as what its, you know, what its main point is might be significant for you might trigger some new idea for you. You know, as scholars, it's, it, we find it's, it could be some little aside in a footnote that becomes the basis of an entire book because it, you know, triggers something uh, uh, very, very important. But so individuals, though, can make these kinds of decisions. The bigger problem is on the macro level where it's very hard for to make these decisions as uh, collectively, uh, per, you know, particularly politically, where, uh, you know, in one sense, you know, capitalism, uh, uh, the free market, kind of guarantees uh, that you will let technology run free because it's all about innovation and finding new markets and competition, getting ahead of the other person. So capitalists will tend to let this run free and and we all you know certainly on the side of values freedom is very important and uh and that sort of thing but even to take you know congress just recently uh voted to uh re require tiktok to be sold because it's owned by a chinese company um although some of the investors are are on the right wing uh, in in the united states and therefore um you know there there's now some uh, some talk among the Trump MAGA people about not selling it, mm -hmm. not forcing this sale, <clears throat> but also who who steps up then to say we'll buy it? It's it's again it's the tech billionaires or you know or, or the other billionaires. So who owns TikTok doesn't really matter that much. I mean it, it can make a difference in small ways that might make a difference in people's lives here or there, but the big picture is that. Who owns TikTok doesn't matter because the format, this audiovisual short video format, is going to have almost everything to do with what is done on TikTok, you know, what kind of content there is, and with things like how much attention span, you know, it is going to uh, reinforce the undermining of people's attention span and focus and their rational thinking because it's going to be all audiovisual rather than, you know, when it's in print, it gives us distance and allows us to reflect and all that. It's going to be conducive to emotional reactions, which has the positive, the benefit when we're talking about injustice and people say we have to do something about it. It can motivate people, but often is used for propaganda and manip you know, manipulative purposes. So who owns it makes less of a difference. And if we get rid of it, some other company will just create another app that Something does the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and which is also a key part of media ecology is that it's the medium that counts and not who owns it. Again, it's not to say that who owns it doesn't make a right. difference, but it's of lesser significance. Uh -huh. And it's not so much the content because any particular TikTok video is is trivial, but it's the overall effect of the medium and of doom scrolling through TikTok. That's the effect that it has. So that's where we're saying in media ecology, pay attention to the way that we do things. You know, the overriding question is how. How we do things is the first question we need to ask because everything else is going to follow from how, from the method the means, okay. the medium that we use. Awesome. Yeah, great. And uh, well, correct correct me if I'm wrong, but I think these this kind of questions and these kind of topics and these conversations are also a way to, uh, well, we're all re related, I think, it, like in academic terms, I believe. Uh, for example, Laura has a, a great book uh, published a couple of years ago about digital humanities. It's um, yes. Humanidades Digitales en Contexto, digital humanities in context, right? So um, I think this is where ac academics can start, well, we all do it all the time, I, I presume, but we can 
uh, keep sharing and um, enriching each other's views and, and perspectives Absolutely. to try yes. to understand uh, not only what is going on, but also trying to explain why it's going on, actually, right? I mean, digital humanities, I, I, I recently discovered the field, <laughs> yeah. actually, but I, th I believe it's, it's amazing, right? Are we, ask, we are asking Laura to tell us what is digital humanities? Absolutely. Can you explain it? Yes, of course. Digital humanities is um, a discipline that looks for uh, find a new ways uh, for human beings to communicate or to... Um, to um, have uh, information from another human being with different media. So we are uh, very worried about uh, the human nature and how uh, human beings develop through all these uh, mediums. So I think this uh, new area is very related with media ecology, of course, and general semantics. And certainly we're great supporters of the humanities in general. and I. You know, I think Neil Postman, for example, just to go back to our old professor, I mean, was a real champion of the humanities uh, and, uh, and of liberal arts education. And uh, here we are, Tom and I both teach at uh, liberal arts institutions in the United States. And here we are with you two uh, at a wonderfully uh, liberal arts oriented institution in Mexico. Yeah, that's right. I, I personally, I majored in philosophy. Oh, uh, did you? Yes, yeah, an undergrad. And then now, what is your opinion on Aristotle? <laughs> wow. Well, being at Universidad Panamericana, that's a really hot <coughs> topic because, um, well, my opinion on Aristotle on what? <laughs> because uh, it, it, there's so much in Aristotle. <laughs> well, do you like him? Absolutely. Yes. Actually, my dissertation for my undergrad uh, was on Aristotle for yeah on ethics. I studied. Our soul's vision on friendship, uh, oh. and I try to bring that to the present day and, and study friendship, especially friendships uh, between a, a man and a woman, or yeah, men and women, as uh, yeah, people from the ge different genders and sexes. That that's really fun. And what was your conclusion? That Aristotle was very right in describing the generals of what friendship is, but as he was so wrong about women and his view on women. Uh, he was just biased and he didn't pursue that topic further, but it would be really interesting to have his view on that. But that's, yeah, that's, the problem is his, his view on women. Um. I see. <laughs> and, and that is very, very much in keeping with general semantics, right? We, we mm -hmm. uh, Korzybski coined the phrase non-Aristotelian to refer to a general orientation that general semantics would be one example of. But it's not anti-Aristotelian. That's right. right. Aristotle's from a long time ago. Uh, I think it was Bertrand, Bertrand Russell who said that Aristotle said that men have more teeth than women. And it, even though he was married, it never occurred to him to actually count, count. <laughs> the te how many teeth his wife had. I, Laura, I, you are, of course, very much interested in Aristotle yourself. I mean, how do you feel about this? Well, I think Aristotle was the... the the biggest philosopher uh, in history and I think it's uh, um, uh, he has a lot of relation with media ecology it's, it's, it's everything mm -hmm. in fact my book about the formal cause uh, explains a lot um, how um, um, Aristotle uh, t uh, talked about the formal cause and how the formal cause uh, is uh, uh, very important for human beings and the relation the human being uh, has with the with the world. And after that, uh, Marshall McLuhan also uh, talked about uh, formal cause and how formal cause um, is in the media and how uh, these media uh, change our ways to to think and to experience uh, all the reality. And and what is this book again? Um, you 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 know better the the title than I, than me. I think you know the title of your book. <laughs> Published by, the Pol yes, by General Semantics, of of course. Zachary Published Hume. by the Institute of General Semantics yes. and winner of the twenty twenty three 
Marshall McLuhan Award for Best Book in Media Ecology from the Media Ecology Association. Well, congratulations. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> the formal cause in Marshall McLuhan's thinking. Thank you very much, Lance. <laughs> and available for sale. I'll add on the IGS the, website from the Institute of General Semantics from our Shopify store, but also through all major yeah. online booksellers, Amazon, Amazon Barnes yeah. and Noble, or whatever, and for a very reasonable price, I might add. <laughs> and formal cause, since you mentioned it, Aristotle talked about formal cause. What what is that? Well, uh, it's a. Um, um, very difficult term because uh, for Aristotle, um, when we, we, if we want to know things, we need to find four causes. So uh, um, the material cause, the formal cause, efficient cause, and final cause. But, but I think that the most important cause of everyone is formal cause because is what um, what the essence is for the for the being so i think if uh, we relate this term with marshall Ma mcluhan mcluhan also uh, just to say that the formal cause is uh, the the most important cause in society because it's the media which um, um, make changes in the society uh, through the history. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, and I'll add to that. I mean, it, it helps to explain because you know, here's the thing, right? We, Tom and I are just saying how something like uh, cell phones and smartphones and social media make us more distracted and less focused and all of that. And one criticism that other scholars who don't, who are stupid and don't understand <laughs> this will say is that you can't prove that, you can't show that, that one causes the other. Uh, and they're thinking about efficient cause, you know, which mm. is cause and effect, like Newtonian mechanistic kind of causality. But what formal cause in Aristotle o uh, opens up is the idea that the there is a form to all things and that we create an environment then, you know, we formed a new environment in which that shapes us in different ways. Uh, it's also Terence Deacon, who was a student of Gregory Bateson, a uh, wonderful book, Incomplete Nature. He gave the Alfred Krzybski Memorial Lecture some years ago, but he related formal cause to this, you know, and there's an interesting idea, downward causality, rather than like say the billiard balls, one ball hits the other, downward causality is how the billiard table mm -hmm. sets up an environment, a situation in which only some things can happen, but many things cannot. Mm -hmm. It constrains and limits the possibilities. It doesn't dictate what the balls will do, but it creates a situation in which some things are easy to do and tend to happen, mm -hmm. and other things are impossible to do or very difficult uh, to do. So downward causality is the causality in which the environment influences what's inside the environment. And I think that's something we can all understand. So you introduce a new technology, you've created a new environment, a new semantic environment, a new media environment, and that changes all aspects of what goes on inside that environment. And, and with respect to the criticism, you know, well, you can't prove that. Um, to go back to Marianne Wolf and, you know, presenting the neuroscience that, well, no, it, can we prove anything in the social sciences uh, and certainly in the humanities? Well, here is a good case. Here is clear evidence as much as at least she can put forth in her, her two books. Um, I, I think about the fact that when I was uh, an undergraduate student and um, uh, had a girlfriend who went to a very important uh, uh, math and science and applied science university in the States, um, I met these people who were working on, when, when Watson and Crick 
discovered the human genome, discovered the double helix. That started the process where, okay, now that we've discovered this, let's map it out and, and figure out how to understand it incomplete, and, and then we'll be able to take the science from there to possibly, you know, help ourselves. I'm, I'm a little nervous about the ways we might help ourselves to, you know, live longer. I don't know if we should, but, but what happened after Watson and Crick is there are all of these people all over the world doing their little piece of the research that allowed us to, in this century, map the human genome. So here are Lance and I talking about all of these things. And what we're sort of doing is to drop the seeds, okay, let's go on and do the hard research if you think that that's necessary. Gather the evidence to, to justify and bolster uh, those claims. I just want to add on proof because yeah. you made me. It reminded me of our old professor Christine Nystrom, uh, who was also very active with General Semantics and with with the journal, etc. When when Postman was editing it, um, and she was also uh, guided many PhD students, and I think it was at someone's defense, oral defense. Where where you got had had someone from the outside criticizing like you can't prove that, and she said, well we, we proof you know we can't prove that anyone actually spoke before 1877. Exactly. Yeah. Right. For those who don't know what that date signifies, that's the date recording. that sound recording was invented. So there is no proof of actual speech. Right. That's no great. evidence. No hard evidence of human speech before 1877. In other words, you want your proof? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then going back to Aristotle, it was, it was Aristotle who specifically said that arguments and demonstrations should correspond to the object you are studying. I mean, trying to find hard evidence in social studies, as uh, I, I believe Aristotle would be happy to call ethics and politics, social studies or social sciences, uh, of course, I mean, the demonstrations and the kind of proof that you can get depends on the topic you are researching, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I believe what, what I was, uh, because, um, well, I, I believe this is a and, great and topic. Just, you, for, know, yeah. you know, the Aristotle mm -hmm. is respected in general semantics. In We just published a yeah, new right. edition of Science and Sanity, Korzybski's magnum opus, and he lists, it has this long list of people it's dedicated to, and number one is Aristotle. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Oops, go ahead, please. No, sorry, and, and I just uh, kept thinking about the, the well, the criticisms you you were talking about, and um, I just wanted to just yeah, uh, I pity for your thought on this, but um, wouldn't you say that part of that criticism or people not understanding this point of view is comes from denying or not being content with the actual nat notion of nature? I mean. Uh, nature as a uh, well, and uh, how did I come to this uh, idea? Yeah, I mean, how did you come? Yeah, to this, <laughs> right? uh, well, formal cause is very close to uh, essence, and essence can be explained as nature. Um, just to skip, I don't know how many steps in that syllogism, right? Um, but if we as a society are not accepting nature to be something real, not necessarily settled and written or on a hard stone. I mean, nature can evolve and it actually does evolve. But if you're having a discussion with someone that does not accept the notion of nature or something, as something real, um, then, I mean, how can we even try to come to, argue, to demonstrations or, or definitions or, on anything? Lance has been talking over the last couple of days about the various other creatures on Earth that have technology, uh -huh. that create things. And you've talked about, you know, antills and bees, uh, hives, and um, uh, I thought of beaver dams, which you never mentioned, right? I did, actually. Oh, you did? Okay, I, yeah. I, I missed that. Maybe you did it last night when I wasn't there. Um, uh, and bird nests are, bird are nests. the really big one. You think about elaborate constructions. Oh, that's, yeah. that's great. But so human beings, and with respect to, to nature, to the planet, human beings, and, and as time binders, right, to use the general semantics term, who developed language and 
the language from the roots of, of writing through print, right, and, and mass literacy, or the extent to which we've ever been mass literate, um, it's, it's that learning and knowledge that allowed us to create technologies like, again, I look at this room that we're sitting in and the equipment that we're using to, to do this and the fact that we're going to, you're going to use it for your purposes here in Mexico City and at the university and we're going to use it for ourselves. And, right. So we have recreated the planet, if I can say it, in, mm -hmm. in our image through all of these things that have, have effectively taken us away from nature over time, further and further. And uh, you know, I, again, I think of the fact that this room is air conditioned, right? You know, mm -hmm. so it mm -hmm. keeps it, right? I, I think of the fact that, oh my goodness, flush toilets, right? We're running water. Th that's, okay. we, we consider that normal, but it was a luxury to people earlier on in the, in the 20th century. Um, so if, if you take the sum total of all of these things, we have, we are the species that has reshaped nature of the planet completely and continue to do so. And it's incumbent upon us to, to be thinking about the question and with what effect. Mm -hmm. And we even say that we don't even know what nature is anymore that, uh, you know, I, I explain, you know, I grew up in New York City, and to me, you know, something like going to a farm would be going to nature. And, and I think, by and large, people don't realize that farming is technology and that it has radically reshaped uh, much of the planet, uh, you know, and that, you know, you think about going to a park, you know, and that the uh, garden, you know, that these are human inventions and constructions that we create uh, to try to bring back a little bit, but in, in a safe way, right, in, in a way that serves our purposes rather than in what the, you know, ecosystem, the, the ecological environment or the natural environment. I'm, I'm trying to avoid natural because mm -hmm. it's a loaded term and problematic and we always have to think about the words that we're using but uh you know you know in a way that we think about the wilderness if you like as be as sort of that you know biology on its own we don't like that you know we've always been fighting against that and you know f to the for the purpose of our own survival but uh often uh in ways that ultimately are dysfunctional even for our own survival, and that is indeed the problem. That's why you know, I'd say, you know, media ecology. You know, when you talk about media ecology, which again is, is you know, incorporates general semantics and the kinds of thinking that we're talking about. You know, is it, it is more than just let's study media. You know, it's a way of looking at the world and thinking about the world. You know, and looking at our problems in ways that hopefully we can, uh, find out of, that out of it we can get practical solutions that will solve some of these problems um, and, and hopefully keep us from destroying ourselves. I don't think we'll destroy the planet. Uh, I think it'll go on without us. But, you know, maybe human survival would be something that we might want to think yeah. about. It'll be nice. Yes. <laughs> for <laughs> for the uh, So I feel like we're coming to the end here. I, I'm getting. I, we, you, I, you folks don't see the nonverbal signals we're getting, but I think we're we're getting to that. Or Tom, you you don't think so? Are you? Uh, no, no. I I was looking toward you while you were talking. I wasn't looking oh, around. Yeah, you want to? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this would be especially for your time. I mean, we are. Re I'm really excited to to be here with you guys, and, and I love this conversation, and I would love to keep it going for hours and hours. But um, you still have a full day ahead, and uh, I don't know. I'm not sure of all your commitments today, but um, it's been lovely to have you here, and and of course. Uh, I hope this is a good episode for your podcasts. <laughs> well, it, it is, and, and on behalf of Tom and myself, uh, you know, I'd like to say thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, both, you know, thank you to Laura for bringing us to 
uh, Panamericana and Mexico City. And thank you, Gustavo, for hosting us here, our podcast here in your media lab, your wonderful media lab. And, uh, you know, just uh, I think this has been a great episode and and we're very appreciative. Yeah, and we hope your listeners appreciate it all, too. Sure, I, I, I did. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was, it was a lovely conversation. <laughs> Muchas gracias. <laughs> gracias a ustedes. <laughs> That's great. Okay. That was great. You've been listening to our March 2024 episode of Semantic Reactions, recorded at Panamericana University and featuring IGS trustees Lance Strait, Tom Gencarelli, Laura Trujillo, and Panamericana's Media Lab Director, Gustavo Navarro. We want to extend our special thanks to the university, to Professors Trujillo and Navarro, and to the recording engineer and director, Goretti Mata. Muchas gracias. If you like what you've heard, or even if you haven't, please consider becoming a member of the Institute of General Semantics, if you're not one already. In addition to supporting our efforts, IGS members receive an annual subscription to our journal, etc., a review of general semantics, access to our online and in-person events, lectures and seminars, and discounts on the books and audiovisual materials that we sell. Regular membership is only $50 and half off for students. Your membership and any additional donations you care to make will help to support our offerings and activities as we work to bring a measure of sanity to the world. The Institute of General Semantics is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to research and education on a wide range of topics. They include language and symbols, meaning and perception, communication and representation, media and technology, science and epistemology, creativity, and critical thinking. We are dedicated to making the world a better place through practical strategies for improving our semantic environment, individually and collectively. For more information about the Institute and our activities, and to become a member and supporter of our work, please visit our website at generalsemantics.org. That's generalsemantics, one word, dot org. And this brings to a close our 19th episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. This is Ben Houck signing off, saying, we hope you'll join us next time. And until then, just remember this simple fact, that the map is not the territory.